So Dr. Boehner. Hi, good morning. And uh, as Alicia said, I, I wish I was allowed to, to join you in person, but I'm uh, just delighted to be invited to the day of learning, especially because as Alicia said, I was a fellow many years ago. So today I'm going to provide an update from CDC's Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network, or ADAM Network for short. So back in December, the ADAM Network published two new reports uh, as MMWR surveillance summaries, uh, one on the prevalence of autism and another on the early identification of autism from the 11 participating communities in the ADAM Network in 2018. And so today I'll highlight some of what I think are the most important or interesting aspects of these reports and tell you a little bit about uh, a couple of the projects we are currently working on that we're hoping to share later this year. So these latest reports uh, were the first to use an updated methodology in the ADAM network. Uh, just as in the past, ADAM sites collect information from medical, educational, and service records from multiple sources in the community, and then they, they link them all together. And we were able to become much more efficient. And this allowed the ADAM network to disseminate results faster. So these reports came out in December. Usually they would come out like around now in the spring. Uh, and we, we plan to uh, further accelerate our timeline for the next round. Uh, and the methods allowed CDC to support more sites than would have been possible uh, with the previous methods, uh, expand activities. Now all of the ADAM sites are tracking progress in early autism identification, which uh, basically tripled the population size uh, that, that's covered. Uh, and um, we're able to use more sources of data, which has been, uh, in retrospect, kind of a, a blessing with some of the barriers that uh, have come up during the pandemic, and that's really made the system more robust. And uh, perhaps most importantly, we uh, the, the focus is now on um, reporting uh, what is actually happening in the community. And so it's much more uh, transparent uh, about you know, how children are being identified and served and evaluated in their communities, which is what public health surveillance really should do, which is to inform and ultimately improve practice. We also published a paper comparing the previous and current methods, uh, showing that they produce, produced very similar results overall, uh, sometimes the same results. Uh, through the previous two rounds of Adam. And uh, by the way, this wouldn't have been the case uh, 20 years ago when Adam began, because this really shows how things have changed over time. So the Adam Network is a population-based surveillance system that tracks autism among children living in different communities. These are the 11 participating sites for the 2018 surveillance year in green here. Uh, while this is not a nationally representative sample, it covers a large population. So between the four and eight-year-olds, it, uh, it covers about 440,000 children. And it includes uh, lots of geographic and demographic diversity. So with that background, this chart shows the overall autism prevalence for every ADAM surveillance year since it began in 2000. And the overall prevalence for the 11 communities in 2018 is represented by the rightmost bar, which corresponds to about 2.3% or one in 44 children. And so while there's a general upward trend over time, it's important to keep in mind that some of the participating communities have changed from year to year. So these are, in, in my opinion, uh, the three most important findings from this report on prevalence. Uh, so first, the bar chart on the left shows autism prevalence uh, reported in each of the 11 sites, and the large range in prevalence estimates suggests large differences in practices between communities in how children are being evaluated and diagnosed. And so having these local data show this variability and hopefully suggest what might be needed in each situation. And so it, it kind of reminds me of a, a famous uh, quote uh, that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So the, the second thing is the, in the middle figure, uh, it shows autism prevalence by race and ethnicity. And overall, there was little difference between the racial and ethnic groups um, at some of the, within some of the sites. 
uh, the prevalence in Hispanic children was lower than uh, white or black children. So there are still some disparities that remain, but they, overall they're smaller than they were in the past, which could indicate more equitable access to uh, you know, all children being seen by professionals or receiving services. So one uh, disparity, uh, so, so if the gaps are closing, one disparity that's persisted is uh, this third figure, which um, it, it shows uh, differences <clears throat> in co-occurring intellectual disability. The ATOM network collects information on uh, IQ tests or cognitive functioning. And uh, there continues to be a higher proportion of black children with autism that are also classified as having intellectual disability compared to white or Hispanic children with autism. And the reason for this isn't fully understood, uh, but it could reflect inequities in uh, ascertainment or access to services. So in addition to tracking prevalence, the ADAM network has also tracked uh, early identification of autism. And historically, uh, the reports would present the average or the median age at when children were first diagnosed. And there hasn't been much change in this uh, metric. And people have interpreted this to mean there's been no progress. And so this here is just an example of, of how this is often interpreted uh, from a recent paper um, that says, you know, despite it being a national priority, the average age of autism diagnosis has remained stubbornly stuck at four or five years of age. And, and they're not wrong to say that the median age has been stable because it has been. And so this figure shows little change between 2002 and 2016. But if more children are being diagnosed at younger ages and an equal number are being diagnosed at older ages, the average isn't going to change that much, even if more total kids are getting identified. So does this measure show that there's been no progress over 15 years, or does it show that the measure isn't capturing the changes that did happen? So to answer this question, Kelly Shaw led a paper uh, comparing the different ways of measuring uh, you know, progress in early autism detection. And to summarize, the median age of diagnosis measure that's been used in the past shows very little has changed while the cumulative incidence, which is the amount of kids actually identified by age 48 months has quadrupled. And so there's a lot more in the paper, but it outlines the reasons for preferring this incidence-based measure that is sensitive to showing both changes over time and also uh, disparities. And using a metric that can show these changes are happening is probably going to be more useful to, in to help inform uh, and evaluate uh, policies and programs. So uh, the Adam Network in a separate report uh, now re focuses on uh, early identification, particularly among children age four years. And this was the first time that all of the Adam sites were tracking kids uh, for at, at both four and eight years of age. And so this allows us to make uh, comparisons to see uh, whether children in this younger group are getting identified at a faster rate than the children in the older group. And they were. And so these kinds of comparisons can't be done just by looking at you know, the average age of diagnosis in each group. And so now we have the data to say that if identifying more kids earlier is progress, then there is progress. And these findings were prominently highlighted in the communication materials that accompanied these reports uh, that you know, these data more clearly show that you know, what has been happening and that it is a big change and, and a big difference from conclusion from uh, concluding that the communities are not making progress in identifying autism early. So I also wanted to take a minute to tell you about three of the things we have for hopefully later this year. Uh, along with the two reports I just talked about, several ADAM sites are uh, also followed up on children at age 16 that were initially detected at age eight by ADAM and the focus is going to be on health and mental health and planning a transition for post high school activities and services. Michelle Hughes at CDC is leading this work and I think she's actually going to be submitting it to a journal this week. There's also a paper estimating how many children with autism might meet the description of profound autism, uh, which 
sure a lot of you have heard of. It's a term recently developed by the Lancet Commission on Autism and explained in the previous ASF Day of Learning. And our goal is to contribute population level data to better understand who this term might apply to and perhaps how it could be useful. And so finally, uh, seven ATOM sites were selected for a pilot project to use data linkages for, to do efficient statewide autism prevalence estimates, uh, not necessarily to replace the core ATOM activities, but to explore ways to efficiently generate data uh, that will speak to what's happening in communities that have never had local data. Uh, finally, at CDC has lots of resources and data available on the autism website. Uh, you can Google CDC Adam or CDC Autism and find the community report, which summarizes the latest findings from the MMWRs I just talked about uh, for people that might prefer that to the more scientific papers. CDC also maintains a website showing state level autism data, not just from Adam, but from several other national data sources. You can look up what's available for your state uh, or just download all of the data. And I also wanted to mention our colleagues with CDC's Learn the Science Act early program. They recently updated all of their developmental milestones and they have an app for parents that uh, I actually used when my son was younger and it's great. So uh, I just wanted to um, acknowledge uh, all of the, the amazing people and express my gratitude to them both at CDC and across the country whose passion and dedication makes this work successful. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. We have time for a couple of questions. Thank you, Matt. Um, I have two questions. One, when you're looking at the states, are you looking just at the eight-year-olds or are you going to look at the whole range of ages? Uh, you mean in the, the pilot project? Yeah, the pilot. Uh, we're, we're aiming for ages three to 21. And uh, the different states, you know, every, everywhere is so different, but there's um, where some, some are going outside of that age range a little bit to see what they can do. And so we're, we're hoping everyone at least covers three to 21, but um, some, some are trying to go older, some are trying to go younger. Is there a uh, thought to look at how we could look at each state and look at the whole numbers from birth to death of people with autism? I know that's real hard to do, but it, is it would hard. help a lot. <laughs> it, would, it, would be, it would be fascinating. I, um, we, we think about those kinds of things often, and a, a, as other researchers do. Uh, and I, I think my, my feeling is, I think it would take, you know, the, like as often the case, there, you know, a, a single study is never going to be definitive, but answering those kinds of big questions often comes piecemeal with, you know, different contributions focusing on different things. But we'd be we we jump at the chance to participate if there was support for it. Okay, thank you. Uh, this was a great talk. Um, I have a question about the co-occurring uh, diagnosis of um, mental disability in African American children. Mm -hmm. Um, is that within your scope to explore further? Because I heard you say that you don't understand the causes, but is that a plan to explore further? I mean, so I think there are some things that an epidemiological study is really well suited to do at the population level. And so that's understanding that these disparities are happening in the first place. Uh, there's limited opportunities to look at correlates of those things, look at patterns in service utilization, uh, potentially you know, there, there might be opportunities to look at, you know, what, what might put children at more risk uh, or whether it's likely that children are being under ascertained, like if, if black children that don't have intellectual disability are being missed, you know, we would see like, you know, that, that you know, complementary gap in those if the overall prevalence is the same. But I think to really dive into these mechanisms uh, there, there would, you know, especially to do it in a compelling way, there is, uh, you, you know, I think that's where other, other more focused kinds of studies might come in, 
But uh, ideally, it's kind of like a, a feedback loop where in a, in a surveillance program to show something, and then if people understand what's happening and take some kind of action to address the situation, you can evaluate whether it's effective by seeing whether the data change in the future. One more question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Maynard. Um, I have a question about gender. Uh, I noticed in the study, it, I didn't see any particular graphs about the, uh, the breakdown between male and female. Um, curious if that was part of the study, and if not, is there gonna be any planned focus on studies uh, in that breakdown? My, I'm a layman, but my understanding is um, diagnosing females on the spectrum is a little bit trickier because they tend to mask differently than boys do, and um, they tend to present symptoms and, and later um, later in life. So I'm just kind of curious how that comes into play. Yeah, so it's a great question. I had to, you know, I, I had to pick and choose. Uh, the, the, the reports are very data dense and in, um, you know, 12-ish minutes, I tried to try to just hit the highlights, but I would, I would encourage you to go to the website and look at the reports. What's there, we do report uh, different things uh, by boys and girls, and there are some specific analyses over the years from Adam that have looked tried to look at differences between boys and girls with autism. Um, I think that from the level, you know, the, the advantages of the population level, you know, can show us these big picture differences. But I think questions about specific things that happen during evaluation or diagnostic practices, we, we might be able to like suggest clues, but, um, but, but maybe depending on what you're interested in, might not be able to get down to that level of detail. But I'd encourage you to check out the reports and, and see what's on the web. One more question here. Hi, I'm a physician and a parent of a 22-year-old, uh, a high-functioning autistic. And, um, I noticed on the map that Arkansas seemed fairly dense with cases. And so I was wondering if that was um, related to something that you thought was important or if it was just sample uh, differences, et cetera. And also um, why there didn't seem, but it, again, uh, I'm trying to look at my photograph, why it didn't seem that uh, New Jersey uh, was highlighted since uh, it's fairly known that there are a good number of cases disproportionate um, to size. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you, I'm glad you asked. Uh, I guess I, I could have been a little clearer. So that map was showing the, just the areas that were included as you know, that were being tracked. And so uh, Arkansas had a big chunk of the state lit up in green because it's not as densely populated. So they, you know, they needed more counties to get a good sample size. Uh, and New Jersey was, uh, you know, just, but the, the areas in green are really tiny because it's, you know, it's a really major urban area. So the, the number of square miles that they needed to cover to hit the same number of people was a lot smaller. But if, uh, if you squint and look real close, like that New Jersey did have a little bit of green in it too, but those just showed the, the geographic regions that were included. Hey, thank you again, Matt, uh, for today's presentation.